you're welcome to this podcast, which is part of the special series within Living Wholeheartedly, as we think and speak together about human sexuality. Two of these podcasts focus particularly on the Bible, and this is one of them. And the others are uh, conversations which we talk about the experiences and beliefs of those who hold a range of views uh, within Irish Methodism. We know uh, that as a church, uh, we hold a range of understandings on human sexuality and in particular on same-sex relationships. So in that context, I'm delighted to welcome the Reverend Dr. Johnson McMaster. Johnson, thank you uh, for coming to, to talk with us today. Um, tell us a little bit about yourself, first of all, and under the sort of strap line that Methodism has at the minute, living wholeheartedly as followers of Jesus for the transformation of the world, what that means for you. Well, I'm, I'm a native of the Ards Peninsula. I was born in the Ards Peninsula, County Down, grew up there in a fishing village, Port of Ogie. Um, a lot of life was spent around Dastry Methodist Church. And um, I, I gather they celebrated their 175th anniversary just before the end of last year. Um, but I, that's where growing up was, was, was done. I, I often describe um, life there as living with three Fs, uh, fun, fish, and, and faith. Um, now, I've, from there, I came here, um, spent some time in Edge Hill, obviously, and then uh, had my first appointment in, in West Cork in an area that, that you know well. Um, in terms of the, the, um, the, the theme, the, the church theme and living wholeheartedly, um, I could come at that, I suppose, from a number of angles, but... For me, that's about life commitment. Mm -hmm. It's about the practice of values uh, and a particular focus on what is important and has always been important for me, I think, is, is a focus on, on the Sermon on the Mount and Matthew's Gospel. Um, and I think it's remarkable and it's had a remarkable influence in, in, in a lot of, of history as well. Um, the Beatitudes in particular, which I, I see as the essence of the essence of the values that are uh, part of what was being called the kingdom or the reign of God. And, and those values are lifestyle values. Um, I believe they are commitment. Um, we're talking about, um, about um, compassion, uh, nonviolence, justice, peace. Uh, and then I think the sermon comes to an end with a rather remarkable ending, which for me is important um, in the practice of life and commitment. Um, Matthew's version rather rather terrifies us, I think, because be perfect even as your Father in heaven is perfect. And we run a mile. Um, we prefer Luke, maybe, be compassionate as your Father in heaven is compassionate. But behind Matthew, there is Aramaic, it was the language of Jesus. And the Aramaic translates as be all, in, all inclusive as your father in heaven is all inclusive. And that I think fits with the literary context, the, 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 the text above, which talks about a God who makes the sun shine and the rain to fall and the good and the bad alike without discrimination or without um, differentiating or whatever. Mm. So that's what it means. The ideal may be, I'm not going to say that those are always um, part of, of practice, but but they are they are important values by which I think one aims to live one's life and live out one's life in 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 and practice in the world and in life itself uh, as 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 commitment to um, to Jesus Christ. Really helpful, thank you. So leading on from that, then Johnson, what are the what are the biblical passages that have formed your understanding of same sex relationships in particular? Can I start with an experience first? Because yes. I, I think it's, it's important. It's about 25 years ago now. Um, and I had, um, there was in Belfast at the time, and Belfast and Greater Belfast, a support group uh, for parents of, of gay and lesbian young people. Uh -huh. I'm not sure how, but I got asked to, to go along and meet this group. Mm -hmm. um, and I went along and there was about 50 there, probably. And, and, I, I sat down at the front of the group. It was a big, big circle or a couple of big circles. It was one of the most difficult nights of the group I think I've ever spent. And I've, I've had 
I've been in a number of groups where things have been difficult, but 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 this this really was. They knew I was a minister. They weren't all Methodists. They were from mm -hmm. different churches, but they knew I was a minister. And as far as they were concerned, I think there was even an apology at one stage that nothing was personal here. Okay. I was just a church. I was a church sitting in front of them, mm -hmm. and I got it. Uh, pain, hurt, um, at the way their kids had been treated, the pain and the hurt that the kids themselves had suffered, um, and it was a it was two hours of of, of quite a quite a quite quite a grilling, and I think I may have thought about some of this before then, but after that I really had to to think very hard about uh, about the whole. Um, gay, lesbian, same-sex, LGBTQI plus stuff. So it, 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 you became aware then that there were certain texts that were being um, talked about. Mm -hmm. And, and um, about the same time, I suppose, we had running around the same time in, in Northern Ireland a big campaign against sodomy. Right. Um, and and the, the big key text was Genesis 19, and that even made an appearance on on Talkback and in Radio Ulster. There were various discussions with people, um, Genesis nineteen, um, and and so I I started to I started to look at that, and I think in time started to discover it's a brutal text. It's not about same sex relations at all. It's about gang rape. It's got a parallel text in Judges nineteen. And it's 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 um it's about ignoring or breaking the the rules or the courtesies of hospitality in a, in an Eastern culture, and and it's about misogyny because they're prepared to throw a woman out instead of the the guy that the the rapists uh, want. Um, and then you realise that the word sodomy and sodomite. Was only they were only invented in the eleventh century, right. didn't exist before then. Um, but you realise that, and certainly the campaign for against sodomy was was making much of Genesis nineteen through the through that lens, mm -hmm. through the lens of those eleventh century invented words, uh, and had nothing to do with with same sex relations at all. The sin of Sodom, I then discovered, comes up. Um, 15 times in the rest of the Bible. So you went looking that up and discovered that only two of the 15 have got something to do with sex. And that's in the letter of Jude and the second letter of Peter. Mm -hmm. And um, it's, it's, it's sex with angels, whatever that's about. Um, there's mythology behind it. There was a parallel book at the same time um, uh, as, as those two letters were, were produced, first Enoch, and Jude actually quotes first Enoch 1 verse 9. Um, sex with angels, well, whatever that's about. The other, the other 13 say nothing about sex. The sin of Sodom has got nothing about sex. The classic example is Ezekiel. And, and, and uh, in Ezekiel, the sin of Sodom is, is um, opulence, obscene wealth and absolute disregard and lack of care for the poor right. and the oppressed. And Isaiah makes the same point. And nearly the other references are, are the same. So the sin of Sodom, Sodom uh, in, in Scripture is recognised as being something to do with economic injustice and exploitation and oppression. So that shifted one's gear mm -hmm. in terms of what, that text was about. There were there are others. I mean, there are two key texts, I think, in, in, in Romans one yes. and First Corinthians six. Um, they're complicated because Paul uses a word in in in, in one, maybe both, in fact, where um, nobody's been able to find a use of it in any Greek literature before Paul. He, he had a first, maybe. But um it, it does seem in the in the context in which he's writing that that again, that may not have anything to do with same-sex relations, okay. uh, because the 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 the, the um, when you follow through to 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 First Timothy one, for example, uh, and the word occurs again, 
And then the word occurs in, or a similar word occurs in, in writings between the second and the fourth century, translated every time as the corruption of children. So what Paul, and taking into account the context of the Greco-Roman world, what Paul may be getting at in those two texts, and I say may, mm -hmm. because interpretation is hugely difficult, mm -hmm. pedestry. Yeah. The, 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 the biggest same-sex relationship in the Greco-Roman world was freeborn adults who had sex, particularly in the gymnasiums, with boys from the age of 10 to when a beard started to first appear. And that was quite normal, or at least considered normal. Mm -hmm. And I think Paul was a Greek moralist, and, and their, their writings are the same. Their, their vice lists are similar. Yeah. That seems to be what um, he's, he's, he's getting at. Um, so that may not be saying what we... Sometimes I thought it said mm -hmm. either. So I suppose the point is the biblical text, and there are about six of them, mm -hmm. main ones, um, they need interpretation. They need robust exegetical work. Uh, and they need to be read in the context of the first century. And, and that context, sex and sexuality were very thought of very differently from our world. Paul is dealing with his world, not our 21st century, yeah. where some of our language wasn't even invented mm -hmm. uh, when, when Paul was around. So I, I've had to, I suppose that experience 25 years ago sent me off uh, doing some biblical reflection and study and a bit of digging. Mm -hmm. And um, I, 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 think there's, I think there is a lot of robust exegetical work to be done on those six passages. Really helpful, thank you. And starting with an experience there, Johnson, and then as that did, drove you into into Scripture. Mm. As as Methodists, wherever the source of it, yeah. we sometimes talk about Scripture, reason, tradition, experience. How do you balance those in your own mind? Because the, the question's often put to folks who have uh, an affirming view around same-sex relationships that uh, experience is being valued uh, over scripture. How would you counter that or how do you balance it? Well, I suppose, first of all, that, that quadrilateral um, was not the creation of Wesley himself. Uh, I think we, we've we got Albert Eichler in the 20th century to think, thank for that one. Um, but I think Eichler felt that, that looked like a template on which John Wesley worked. Mm -hmm. and, and it's not surprising maybe that he did because it, it, it's also quite Anglican. Mm. And and um, how do you, for some people the priority is scripture. For others, they will say, "Well, there's somehow or other an interaction and and a, 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 a balancing between between the four. Mm -hmm. um, I think when you when you begin to think about it, at least for me, I find it very difficult to know how you can read scripture without tradition. Okay, and 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 reason and and experience. Mm -hmm. um, if I want to work through them uh, as a way of arriving at some kind of, of, of truthfulness or practice for life, um, I think experience is important. I mean, it's lived human experience. Yeah. And the Bible itself is a book which is reflecting on experiences. It's not a systematic uh, compendium of doctrine or scholastic approach or whatever. It, it's been turned into that sometimes. But I think it's a reflection. When we read stories of the Exodus, for example, they're written a couple of centuries later, but they're reflections on an experience, yes. on a community's experience. And when we talk about experience, I think we've got to move beyond our, it's maybe an Enlightenment, 20, our European Enlightenment view of individualism. We're talking about community experience. We're talking about experience that people have together. Mm -hmm. and, and, uh, and experience is life experience. And most of us, if not all of us, are reading the Bible anyway out of life experience. Yes. Our very location and our experience of life is shaping how we, we read and understand, which is why people who are maybe middle class and are better off or privileged or whatever read the Bible very differently from people who are in abject poverty. Absolutely. Um, 
And I remember um, an experience of that that was enriching in Harare in 1988 at the World Council of Churches Assembly right. when, when we had um, Bible study for three mornings because it was Africa, we were able to sit outside, little groups of eight uh -huh. uh, in, 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 in a group. And on my right-hand side was, was a Methodist woman from Ghana. And on my left was, was a, 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 ma a man from Armenia, an Orthodox. There were no two of us in that little group of eight from the same part of the world. But I'm putting it with some exaggeration now uh, to make the point, I suppose. It was almost as if we were reading different Bibles. Okay. Now, it wasn't that. No. It was because we were coming from different places, yeah. locations, from different experiences, and our experiences were shaping how we were approaching the text. So I think, I think experience is important. We're, we're reading from experience all the time. We're shaped by who we are and what we experience in the world. I'm white. I'm male. Mm -hmm. I'm Methodist. I'm middle class. I'm Irish. That's a fair bit of bias to begin with, yeah. but, but it's, 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 where, it's where one comes from. Mm -hmm. Now, tradition. Well, we have a tradition. There's been an interpretation of the Bible going on for 2,000 years and more. Yeah. They go back to the Hebrew Bible. Um, tradition, though, is not stuck. And this is where I think we get, we get a bit, we make a mistake. Tradition is not something that's fixed. Mm -hmm. I think there's a better word, and it's traditioning. Okay. And traditioning is, is, is that process which is always going on okay. and which we ourselves are adding to and developing the tradition. Mm -hmm. But the tradition is there. Uh, Methodists, we have our own tradition. We have Wesleyan scripture, yeah. and that's worth looking at. Um, and and, and, and we, we have been shaped by that. I've been shaped by that. I grew up with that in mm -hmm. Glastry. Mm -hmm. um, didn't realize it all the time, but you were. Uh, so we have our tradition, our traditioning. So that becomes an important thing as well. Yeah. And then reason. Um, and I think this is where we... We, we need to bring our intellect to, 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 to the Bible. We need to bring our critical reasoning, mm -hmm. above all our critical thinking. We are, after all, asked to love God with all our minds. Yes. So, so, so here are the four, and I think they sit there together, and you can't do one without the other. Mm -hmm. I think there's a kind of an indivisible connection between them. And, and when we read Scripture, I think we're always reading it anyway, out of experience, with traditioning, uh, with reason, and with the text itself. Thank you. Thank you. So how, how would you respond then to someone who in conversation saying, I, you know, my, my concern as I think about same-sex relationships is that if we are affirming, we're undermining the authority of the Bible. Mm -hmm. Well, let me start with something, something else that I think makes a point. Okay. Um, there are 326 references in the Bible to slaves and slavery. Mm -hmm. All but two of them, 324, condone slavery. Right. And, um, or accept or assume slavery to be part of the social, economic, uh, culture and system. Mm -hmm. um, I can't think of a Methodist. And those, those texts, were not only used by slave owners and the plantations who were in church, many of them on Sunday, yeah. but they were used by the churches as well to justify slavery. The Bible backed up slavery. And there you had it, chapter and verse was and were being, being quoted. 2024, I almost said 23, uh, we've moved on. 2024, I can't think of a Methodist from Ken Mayer to Inner Shown mm -hmm. who would say, we need to go back to slavery because the Bible says so. Mm -hmm. So beginning even from John Wesley, who was vehemently opposed to slavery, yeah. we Methodists, if you want to put it in terms of the question, We've been undermining the authority of the Bible for the whole of our existence, nearly 300 years. Um, it's not about the authority of the Bible. Okay. Whatever that is, and every church will say yes to the authority of the Bible, yeah. but express it in very different ways. Yes. Whether it's Catholic, 
Protestant Orthodox or Pentecostal. Mm -hmm. um, it's about it's about our interpretations. It's always about our interpretations. Mm -hmm. And we're always interpreting, and we've always got to interpret. And the beginning was the word, and in the beginning was interpretation, if I like. And 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 what we cannot say, there are Christians I know who who wish to say and do assert that an inerrancy and an infallibility of the text. Mm -hmm. That's fine. Make the case for that. But the question is, what we cannot say or what we cannot talk about, any of us, is the inerrancy and the infallibility of our interpretations okay. of Scripture. So I think the authority of the Bible, however we express that, is one thing. The authority of our interpretations of Scripture is something else. So yes. Very different, and they can't be equated. Uh -huh. And I think when you look through um, 2,000 years of, of, of Christian history in the West, we have a long history of exclusions. Yes and exclusions that were biblically based, we said, and thought. We, we, we excluded the Jews for 2,000 years, said horrible things about them, uh, slaves, women, mm -hmm. the earth. Now, we've had to acknowledge that a lot of this we've got catastrophically even wrong. Mm -hmm. um, it's not that the text has changed, but our interpretations of the text have changed in a lot of those situations. We no longer read the Bible, I think, against Jews. We no longer read the Bible against women. We no longer read the Bible against slaves. A large section of a white Protestant community in North America and here still reads the Bible now against Palestinians. Um, and I think we learn after a while that we've got that wrong as well. But it, it's the interpretation that changes. And if we look at 2,000 years of the history of interpretation in Scripture, it keeps changing in many things. Mm -hmm. we, 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 we reach points where we have moral struggles with issues and begin to realise that um, time makes ancient good on coasts. And, and, and um, some of our interpretations were not only wrong, but even immoral. So it's not the authority of the Bible. I think we all take the Bible seriously, wherever we define, describe authority. Mm -hmm. But I think we need to realize the authority of our interpretations of Scripture are never to be equated with the authority of the, t the book itself. Very helpful. Thank you. Let's think pastorally then, Johnson. If, um, how, how would you respond if someone in a pastoral conversation was sharing with you that because of their understanding of of scripture and interpretation, um, ha felt it was right to be celibate throughout their life, same-sex attracted, and felt it was right to be celibate. And what was happening now if the church might change its view? How, how would you respond pastorally? I, I think I'm, I want to cover that in, 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 in broad terms and say, um, you want to be celibate, you want to be celibate. I'll give you chapter and verse from the Bible anyway. Okay. Um, that's 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 fine. Anybody w celibacy is a choice. Right. W wherever anybody is on the mm -hmm. spectrum, mm -hmm. celibacy is a choice. Um, but I think there are two two riders to that. And one is that um, by opting for celibacy, that does not. It's a choice, but it does not put one into some kind of Premier League yeah. of spirituality. Uh -huh. It it it. There are people who. There are different models of relationships. Marriage is another. Yes. Um, different forms of relationships. And I think it's important that there's no hierarchy of spirituality or any sort of superiority thing. So, fine. Ce celibacy is, is a choice that's to be made. You need, as long as you know what you're doing, what you're doing it for, uh -huh. that, that, that's fine. Uh, I think the other writer is that enforced celibacy enforced in whatever way, is hugely damaging. And that's a real pastoral issue. Yeah. I think we end up with damaged people who, who have, for whatever reasons, whether same sex or opposite sex, enforced kind of celibacy um, becomes a disaster zone. In many cases, uh, I think it, 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 it destroys people, depressive, um, even suicidal. 
Um, so I think we, we, we need to be careful about enforced celibacy, but, but celibacy needs to be a free choice for anybody who wishes to marry him. Mm -hmm. And I can see, just to push into that, um, the, the folks who are on my mind are folks of deep faith who, formed by those understandings of faith, felt that the, the, the right Christian response, the right discipleship response at great cost is to say so. So would have loved to be in a relationship with someone of the, the mm. same sex, but but out of a disciple, a, a real disciple well, some of people, Jesus. Yeah, I, yeah. People will make, some people will make that choice. Yeah. Others who are no less committed to Christ will not make yeah. that choice. Yes. Um, and this is where we, we've, we've got a bit of wrestling to do yeah. uh, and where we've got to... Um, I mean, one of the one of the things that's very often thrown off about same-sex marriage is that it undermines um, marriage in the family, biblically. Yeah. Well, I think we need, like those other texts earlier, I think we really need to dig into that one a bit yeah. more. Mm -hmm. Because that, that may be an imposed interpretation rather than a piece of exegetical okay. work that comes out of the text. Yeah. Um, Interpreting the Bible's hard work. John Wesley said that. Mm -hmm. And he, he also said something, I think, that three things that I think were, were hugely significant. This is a general comment. Um, our understanding of the Bible, he said, was, was, was their opinions, their interpretation. Mm -hmm. And thirdly, like St. Paul, we're always seeing through a glass dark light. And he, had, he was very aware, I think, and we all need to be aware of the limitations on human, human ability and human skills and the biases and even unconscious biases that we have and bring to the text. Now, I think we do need to look um, at, at... Let me put... This may sound uh, strange and startling, or some people may find it strange and startling. I don't think there is a biblical view of marriage. Right, OK. I think okay. there are biblical views right. of marriage. OK. There are multiple plural models of marriage and family within the biblical text itself. Mm -hmm. um, we all love the story of, 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 of Jacob and Esau. Well, we've preached on it. We've preached it out maybe sometimes. And we, there's a little detail in that maybe, we maybe don't notice. He comes to the brute, Jabbok, and he's wrestling all night with some stranger and mm -hmm. ends up limping away the next morning. Um, but before he spends the night there, he, uh, the, the, the text informs us that that his two wives crossed the fort yes. to the other side to some kind of safety. Mm -hmm. His two wives. Well, practically everybody in the Old Testament had had more than one. Yes. One 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 wife. That I'm, that's already a patriarchal way of putting it. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's a there's a difficulty with that as well that we need to look at critically. Exactly. Um, when we come to First Timothy and and we get um, written late, probably into the first decade and the first. Second century, we've we, we've 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 regulations almost that a bishop or a presbyter uh, must be the husband of one wife. Why does it need to say that? Was there still the possibility in the Greco-Roman world that there could be more than one? Mm -hmm. uh, so a biblical view of marriage is very shaky ground to talk about that. I think, but that doesn't mean we need to look at those texts mm -hmm. very very carefully, yeah. and we need to um, we need to do a bit of solid contextual exegetical work on them before we can come to some kind of, I think, informed, informed view. Now, I, I, think, I think we, if, if the Methodist Church were to move towards the, the acceptance of same-sex marriage, mm -hmm. I think that's a long process. Um, I, think, um, I think civil law needs change to begin with. Because legally we're not we're not allowed, um, but I think the theology of the church would need to be worked out as well, much more carefully and much more thoroughly. Mm -hmm. That's not hedging, I hope, but it's 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 the hard work that we've still got to do. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. What if we differ on these areas as a church, and we differ? Um, what have you learned from people who have a different perspective? I think everything, because um, life is just full of different perspectives. Yeah, yeah. Um, 
the Bible is full of different perspectives, multiple voices. Mm -hmm. uh, the Bible is a book of dispute. And one of the biggest disputes and conflicts and differing perspectives is between what could be described as royal theology on the one hand and the prophetic theology on the other. Yeah. And it runs all the way through the Hebrew Bible uh, and into the Christian Testament itself. And it's in a constant dispute. Um, another one would be uh, in the Bible itself is, is there are texts of terror. There are texts of violence. There, there, there is almost a, at least a literal reading and interpretation of, of Joshua would tend to almost suggest God is the butcher of Canaan. And then the most devastating critique of violence and the mystique of violence comes from the prophet Hosea. So there are perspectives here that are in, in, in are clashing mm -hmm. within the text itself. We get into the Christian Testament and not even into the Christian Testament before we've already mentioned patriarchy. Yeah. The patriarch is the underlying culture, runs all the way through from Genesis to Revelation. Mm -hmm. And we need to be critical and discerning and trying to spot where that's a patriarchal uh, perspective. Mm -hmm. But when we get into the Christian Testament, we, we've got conflicting views on, on the role of women in the early Jesus movement, yeah. in the church. We, we've, John's Gospel and First Timothy probably written around the same time, diametrically opposed. Mm -hmm. why, why is Mary Magdalene so privileged in John's Gospel as, as somebody of huge significance. Mm -hmm. And you get to First Timothy, you've got you've got um, women have got to shut up completely, go away. Uh, and uh, an extraordinary statement that St. Paul would never have written, that salvation for women is through childbirth. Now, that excludes a lot of women to start with. Yeah. Um, so there are different perspectives and different voices in the Bible itself. Life, life is full of it. Uh, I would hate to live in a world where everybody thought the same as I did. Yeah. Um, one of the really enriching experiences, I think, not one, an enriching experience I've had through much of my life, the second half of it so far, I think, has been the encounter that I frequently had with people of other faiths and other traditions. Okay and particularly people from the Muslim community. And, and that has been an encounter, not just here in Ireland, but an encounter that I've been privileged to have internationally, right. Far East, Middle East, Africa, North America. Um, and I would describe that. Now, there, do, that, there are different perspectives there. Mm -hmm. There are common perspectives. Yeah. Yeah. But I would describe that as, as one of the great blessings, in a sense, that, that I've had. Um, about eight years ago, six, eight years ago, um, I, I, an example of this, uh, I, I, I did a lecture in the University of the Punjab in Lahore in Pakistan. Right. And the great hall of, of the university that morning was full, an audience of 800 people. They were all Muslim. I was the only person in that hall who was of another mm -hmm. religious tradition. Um, the interesting thing was the lecture I was asked to give was entitled On Being Human. Right. And the question and response after that were interesting, stimulating, mm -hmm. demanding, challenging, um, enriching. Uh, for the rest of the day, the conversations over coffees, dinner, tea, whatever, um, were, were, were enriching experiences. Mm -hmm. And that, and plus other experiences, uh, and those sorts of encounters, I think I can say have left me um, a better Christian. But maybe more importantly, I think they have enriched me and I'm a better human being. We often... We fear difference. Mm -hmm. We fear people who are different. We fear people who are thinking differently. 
But if we can encounter each other as human beings and, and listen as well as talk, um, I, I think there is, there is an enrichment for everybody. Um, I've just completed a three-year project. We, we've just completed a three-year project with the Irish School of Ecumenics. Uh, uh, is there a common good? Right. Uh, and we've had a whole series of conversations for three years, civic conversations mm -hmm. involving people from across Northern Ireland and the border counties. Um, we're hopefully now to go into a second phase, which may be an all-Ireland series of civic conversations. Um, but the wording's significant. They were civic conversations. They were very different people. They involved Christians, they involved atheists, involved humanists, Baha'i, Hindu, Muslim, Jewish. We had the lot right. in these civic conversations. But we, for, for three years, we had people listening to each other. And, and in those conversations, not the bit, hmm. but conversations, respectful conversations. And, and the kind of feedback you're still getting, and we've seen publications out of that, but the kind of feedback you're still getting is, 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 is people who are different now, they say. Something has transformed. Mm -hmm. um, they, they, they have discovered that their critical thinking has become enhanced, but they've also discovered that they have developed and, and learned how to, to, to listen attentively and, and empathetically to each other. Now, I think that that's where, as churches and as civic society, we, we need to engage a great deal more of. That's about different perspectives, mm -hmm. but it's not a threatening no. thing. And it's not a, I think we get into trouble with that whenever we, instead of talking and listening with each other, it's when we start to denigrate each other. It's when we start to get personal in the thing. Um, it, it's when we, it's when we, um, it, it's when we, we start to, back off and, 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 and make our claims almost absolute mm -hmm. to the exclusion of the other. Yeah. It's about othering the other. And, and, and that destroys human relationships and destroys our being human together and our being community together oh. um, and destroys the search for a common good. Yeah. Mind you, one of the things they discovered in that was that um, illness is not caught in. Indeed. And Terry and Sirvan were not nearly and worn. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so we live with difference. We do. And it can be enriching. Thank you. So as we finish, Johnson, what's what's your prayer for the Methodist Church in Ireland just now? I've let me three three wishes, three dreams, uh but before I get to the prayer bit. Yeah, okay. Um but but I think I would like not just the Methodist Church. I, I think all of the church. We're we're in a we're in a particular place at the moment. I think we're in a place we've never been before. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's over the Western world. There there is something massive changing. Yeah. I mean, it's last year, uh, over three hundred eighty thousand people left the Protestant churches in Germany. Over half a million people left the Catholic Church in Germany. Um, we know this with some precision, at least they do in Germany, because to leave the church, you're required to deregister with the state and you pay 60 euro a time mm -hmm. to do it. So they can keep a track of the figures. They know what's going on. But that's, that's enormous. Church of Scotland have announced that between now and 2030, which is only six years or whatever away, that they, they, they have plans to close 700 churches. So we're all, the Western world is going, Christianity is growing on the planet. Mm -hmm. But it's in the, sun, the global south. It's not not the global north. So in that kind of context, what 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 does one pray for? What does one mm -hmm. dream of? What does one wish for? I think I would like to see churches um, spend a great deal more time engaged in reading the signs of the time, trying to understand what's going on, what's happening, what are the big shifts and changes in society in, in the world. Mm -hmm. Uh, so reading the, reading the signs of the times is, is one thing. I think the other thing is um, churches committing 
much more than maybe we have been. Uh, I'm talking generally now. Committing much more than we have been to a strategy of to an in-depth strategy of of Christian education. Okay. We are church is a moral community and a community of moral formation. Mm -hmm. We we need to be helping people explore uh, ethics and values around the great big issues of our time, right. having read the signs of the times, if you like, mm -hmm. uh, as best we can. And I think the third thing is that um, I would like to see churches um, developing and doing a robust public theology that engages with the major critical big public questions and issues of our era. Now, what does one pray for? Uh, I think I would, at this point, I'll pray with Scripture, if you like, uh, and, 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 and a prayer for any community, including the Methodist community, I, I think would, would, would find its basis in, in, in the prophet Micah, a community that will do justice, um, love kindness, and 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 that word is kesed. The best translation into English of kesed is is, I think, tenacious solidarity. That's that's about inclusion as well. Mm -hmm. Standing alongside, particularly those who are marginalised, oppressed, poor, suffering, whatever, um, and 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 walking humbly with your God. And I think coming out of as we are, and, and I think this is where, this is part of where we are at the moment, coming out of the last 500 years of, 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 of Christian church history in Europe, we need a big dose of humility. Um, I think we need to I think humility means to lower our voices, um, to um, to get rid of our delusional certitudes, mm -hmm. and recover faith, which I think is faith in the deep mystery of the incomprehensible God, uh, but faith also that walks into the unknown future, with the conviction that that whatever is God's future. So, a community doing justice, loving, tenacious solidarity, walking humbly with God. For me, the outcome of that prayer, I think, would be the faith community as a movement um, engaged with not just the life of Ireland, but the life of the world and the planet. Thank you. Thank you. Johnson, thanks so much. I'm going to just pray as we finish and we'll pray into your prayer. Um, let's pray together. Living God, we surrender this conversation to you. And we pray that your church across the face of the earth would be a people who do justice and love kindness and walk humbly with you. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you, John. So, and thank you for uh, listening and for watching uh, this podcast. Uh, we hope that you have found uh, it helpful. Remember that there are others uh, in this series, so do subscribe uh, or find them on your usual channels. Thank you. Thank you.